Okay, I think we can begin now. My name is Patricia Sloan White, and I am the current chair of the Malaysia Singapore Brunei Studies Group, which some of you know is an affiliate of the Association for Asian Studies in the United States. This is the first ever annual lecture sponsored by our group, and we're simply delighted and frankly overwhelmed by the interest and attendance for this event. We have people joining us from all time zones around the globe. If you're joining us very early in the morning or if it's late at night where you are, I truly thank you for getting up early or staying up late to be part of this event. The title of today's talk is NEP at 50. And I can't think of a better speaker for today's lecture. As you likely know, James Chin, who writes extensively on contemporary Malaysia, is our speaker today. James is a professor of Asian studies at the University of Tasmania and a senior fellow at the Jeffrey Chia Institute in Kuala Lumpur. In addition to his extensive work on Malaysia, he's a leading scholar of Sabah and Sarawak politics. Like many of you, I've been unable to visit Malaysia over the course of now two lost research summers. And therefore it's frequently James who writes about Malaysia extensively that has kept me feeling in touch and up to date with what's happening in Malaysia right now. And his topic for today is certainly up to date because he's addressing the outcome of Malaysia's new economic policy, or the NEP, after 50 years of duration. We set the date for today's event as closely as we could to the exact start date of NEP 50 years ago. August 6th, today for those of you in Malaysia, is precisely 50 years to the day that Tun Razak gave the first speech concerning what he called, in inverted commas, Malaysia's new economic policy. He gave that speech in front of the Economic Bureau of UMNO. And for 50 years, people have been writing about NEP. When I first arrived in Malaysia as a young graduate student, that's almost 30 years ago, I focused my research on what I called then the NEP generation. And what I meant by the NEP generation was the first generation of Malays who had benefited most from NEP policies. Today, I study their grandchildren. But that began for me a lifetime of seeking to understand the outcome of a truly extraordinary set of policies that changed Malaysia in so many different ways. I'm delighted that we get to learn today more about NEP at 50 from such a thoughtful and seasoned scholar like James Chin. But before using up more of his time, please allow me to set the agenda for today's event. James will speak for about 30 minutes. And after that, we've invited two outstanding scholars of Malaysia to comment on his talk. First, we'll hear from Sharifa Munira Alatas from University Kabangsaan. Munira will speak for about 10 minutes. And then I will ask our second commentator, Kikua Hamayutsu from Northern Illinois University to speak. Finally, after both of them provide their comment, we'll have time for questions and answers, which I will ask you to put in the chat. And then I will pose those questions to James or to the commentators as requested. So do please write your questions along the way in the chat or at the end. And also please keep your microphones muted. So with no further comment or ado for me, allow me to hand over the program to Dr. James Chin. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Patricia. So I'd like to start off by thanking the MSB, uh, Patricia and Dominic, uh, for kindly organizing this seminar uh, this morning or this evening, wherever you are. So I'll speak for about 25 to 30 minutes. And I'm speaking on the assumption that all of you 
will have a fairly good idea what NDP is about. So let me start off by sharing the screen. <coughs> okay, can you all see that? Good. <coughs> so basically what I would like to do this morning is basically spend one or two minutes as a short, very short introduction to the NEP, followed by some of its key achievements and its key failures, and look at the NEP in terms of what has happened to Malaysia in the last 50 years. And I'll finish off quickly by looking at some of the lessons we can learn from the Malaysian experience with affirmative action. As many of you know, the NEP was promulgated in 1971, and it was the highlight of a thing called the Second Malaysia Plan. It was also the main thrust of the economic policy of the country in the OPP for the 20 year period from 1971 to 1990. So that's the reason why many people said the NEP had a 20 year life plan. The driving force behind the NEP was of course, Malaysia's second prime minister, Tun Razak, and he saw it as a crucial foundation for a new political structure. He was part of a small group of Malay elites who believed that after the 13th May riot, Malaysia had to basically rebuild its entire political structure and that the old system did not work anymore. And he thought that one of the key ways to do it was actually to restructure the entire Malaysian economy. To be fair to Tun Razad, I would argue that he was not the only person who thought this way. It was not purely a Malay establishment idea. Very often when people write about the NEP, they forget about the role played by foreign advisors. In fact, during that time from 69 up to the late 70s, there was always a group of foreign advisors more so than academic economists from leading universities in the West, West, places like Harvard, who are embedded in the EPU in the Malaysian system. And some of these people were intimately involved with the NEP. The most famous among this lot was of course a guy called Jas Fallon. He wrote a book, well, in fact, he wrote two books about his experience in the NEP. But the point I'm trying to make was that, uh, Tun Raza's idea was reinforced by academic experts from outside Malaysia. Now, I don't have to tell you the twin aims of the NEP. It was fairly straightforward. The first one was largely uncontroversial, which was the eradication of poverty. It's the second one, which is a bit more controversial, even at a time when NEP was brought in. And that was the restructuring of society to eliminate the identification of race with economic function. That is just a nice way of saying that we need to bring more of the Malay community into the modern Malaysian economy, especially in the professions. Now, the ultimate aim of the NEP was a thing called national unity. And what was, interested, what was interesting about the way they define national unity was that this was based on the Malay versus non-Malay metrics. Now, to correct the economic imbalance, the policy makers had a very simple way of measuring it. They look at Malay equity around 69 to 70, and they found it was about 2.4%. The target set was 30% by 1990 at the end of the NEP. Now you all know what happened as we headed towards 1990. At that time, Mahathir was the prime minister. He knew that time was coming, and therefore he set up a thing called NECC. He invited Malaysians from across the political spectrum and also across society. He grouped a few hundred people together and they want, he wanted them to produce a report on post-NEP. What many people did not know at that time was that he secretly asked the EPU to come up with a plan because he knew that NECC was not capable of coming to a consensus. Even though NECC produced a big report, Basically, Mahathir just had done the report and put in the plan put in by the EPU. The EPU's plan was remarkably simple. Basically, they changed the name of NEP, kept all the quotas, but put it under a new name. 
What has happened since then, since 1970, the implementation of the NEP, was that we have a change in the narrative about how NEP is being presented, not only to Malaysians, but to non-Malaysians as well. The most obvious one is that NEP is now in Malaysia, especially when you talk to ordinary Malays, is seen as part of the Malay agenda. It is part as seen as Malay rights. Many Mal younger uh, Malays also see as part of their right, their birthright as a native or indigenous person of Malaysia. For some people, it's all about correcting past wrongs or dealing with historical grievances. One of the most interesting explanations of NEP actually came from Amno leader, a political secretary, Tum Razak, who gave a very spare, famous speech in Singapore, where he talks about Malays being the dominant, uh, politically dominant group in Malaysia. And here he not only referred to Malays controlling the political system and the economic system, he part the NEP as part of a larger thing called the social contract. If you read the sort of the reactions to Abdullah's speech in the 1980s and 1990s, especially people who wanted to defend the NEP, one of the constant arguments they use in addition to the social contract is that you should not complain too much because the Malay could have asked for a lot more. And the argument is that the 30% was not enough. We should really be asking for at least 50% or the same as the population ratio. The really sad thing about the way they implemented the NEP is that increasingly the NEP consists of things that was never part of the original NEP that was promulgated in 1971. If you go to Malaysia today, the NEP can be just used to justify everything. And the most obvious one is this thing called a Bumi discount for new properties. If you buy a property in Malaysia, and if you can tell them that you're Bundutra, normally you'll get somewhere between 7 to 12% discount over the price of the property. The unusual thing is that it doesn't matter what sort of property you're looking at. You can buy a multi-million dollar house in Malaysia. And if you're on Bumiputra, you still get your 7 to 12% discount. So I'll quickly move on to the achievements of the NEP. The most obvious achievements, if you were to travel to Malaysia now, 50 years after the NEP, is that you see a flourishing Malay middle class. It is quite clear that this middle class is largely was largely created by the NEP or the opportunities create opportunities in the NEP. And linked to this middle class is of course the education opportunities. It is very obvious that if you go to the professional class in Malaysia, the Malays are now the majority in professions like accounting, medical doctors, dentistry, and all of this was due to the NEP. Another major success I would argue is that because of the NEP, some of the key Malay grievances were removed from the political system. So for example, I've always made the argument that without the NEP, you have given many of the mainstream Malay groups a lot more things to complain about the economy. But because of the quota system, especially the 30% share, and the government procurement system, many of the grievances in terms of Malay participation in the modern economy were taken out. Linked to this is of course the creation of the Bumutra Commerce Industrial Community. Now, some people would argue that these are basically crony capitalists, but I would argue that even though a lot of them were crony capitalists, there were some genuine successful uh, Malay businessmen who became millionaires, uh, you know, not through the Alibaba system, but because they were given a chance to take part in the modern economy. And also many parts of the modern economy in Malaysia that was previously close to the Malay or Bumutra participation were opened up because of the NEP. The one that is most obvious is things like the uh, secondhand car market, 
uh, back in the 70s, it was basically monopolized by the Chinese uh, businessmen. But because of the NEP, uh, because of the AP system, it opened up opportunities for the Malay businessmen. It also opened up new political opportunities for the new rich Malays. Those Malays who became rich under the NEP, it allowed them to take part in the political process. Previously, many of these people were shut off from the political process. Another big area of big success in the NEP is of course poverty. If you look at statistics dealing with uh, Malaysia, poverty has dropped off across the board. One other important achievement that people usually don't talk about is that the Malay equity share, remember the target was 30%. The target was actually reached in the 1990s, even though officially the government has never acknowledged this. The official government figure for Malay equity share has always hovered around 24 to 27%. They've never been able to admit openly that they've actually reached more than 30% since the 1990s. And of course, the reason why they said they never achieved the target is because if you admit that you've achieved the target, this means that you have less reason to carry on with NEP policies. But for me personally, I think one of the biggest achievements of the NEP is that there's been no repeat of a big racial conflict between the Chinese and the Malays since 1969. And I will put it within the context of the region. And I will argue that one of the reasons why Malaysia never went through another May 13 is because of the NEP. Now we come to the failures. I think at the top of the failing list, I think it's quite clear that the NEP has caused a major brain drain in Malaysia. The official figure from institutions such as the World Bank says that about 1 million Malaysians have left Malaysia primarily because of the NEP. In the report, it's called social injustice. But if you speak to other people, demographers who work in this area, they'll say that the figure is closer to 2 million. And it is quite clear that at least 80% of these people are from the non-Malay community. The bottom line is that we have reached a critical stage in terms of the brain drain. And what is interesting is that in the past decade, we can see increasing numbers of Malays also leaving Malaysia because they feel that they don't have the connections, even though they will trust to be successful in the system. So they're part of the brain drain as well. Another area where you can see brain drain happening is of course in the tertiary institutions in Malaysia. Many top non-Malay academics have refused to go back to Malaysia because they feel that there is no place for them in Malaysian universities. Another area where you can see a failure is of course what we call or the economies called the rentier class. And this is what we call the Alibaba business model. So one of the problems with this model is that very often decisions are not made on rational economic ground. It is made on the grounds that this has to be done on Malay agenda, or this is the right of the Bumutras or the share of the Bumutra. So very, so what happens very often is that big projects, uh, multi-billion dollar government uh, contracts will have a built-in margin of somewhere between 15 to 20%, simply because they're part of the Malay agenda. The irony, of course, is that despite all this thing given to the Malay community, the people who benefit most in terms of all these government contracts and economic opportunities are the connected Bumutras, those with the wealth, the political connections, and the know-how. And this means that one of the bigger losers in the NEP is actually the poor Bumabutra, the poor Malays, the poor Malays living in the villages because they don't have the capital, they don't have the education, and they don't have the connections. And that's the reason why in Malaysia, there's a joke that the biggest beneficiary of the NEP are the Amno Putras. And as you know, right, Amno has been the ruling party in Malaysia from independence until 2018. And I suspect they're making a big comeback now. 
I would argue that another key failure of the NDP is that it allows ordinary people to openly pursue racist politics and rhetoric. You can see this very obvious when you read advertisements in Malaysian newspapers. They will openly say that we want an applicant to be a Chinese or Malay. All that sort of thing probably would not have happened or people would be much more careful if there was no NEP. Politically, the NEP has divided the population into Bumutra and non-Bumutra, and it's increasingly becoming a core component of Malay Muslim identity politics. One of the worst consequences of the NEP, I would argue, is the fact that it's made the Sabah and Surat natives into what they call themselves the third class Bumutra. As you know, one of the promises made when Malaysia was established in 1963 was that the natives or the indigenous people of Sabah and Sarawak were to be treated as if they were the Malays of Malaya. So in terms of the affirmative action, they were supposed to be given an equal share but the reality is that if you speak to the natives of Sabah and Sarawak, they will tell you that they're even worse off than the Chinese and the Indians, the non-Bumutra. And that's the reason why they call themselves third-class Bumutra. And of course, my big point here is that the NEP has cemented the marginalizations of the non-Malays because it is becoming normal that key positions cannot be given to non-Malays anymore. Now, I've mentioned national unity because I feel that talking to younger Malaysians, especially non-Malay community, they will tell you that growing up Malaysia, they always felt the second class status, especially when it comes to access to higher education, and jobs in the GLCs. But one of the really interesting things about the NEP was that when you read the original NEP proposal, when they talk about redistribution of wealth or equity, one of the things they kept talking about was taking the share, not so much from the Chinese community, but from the foreign community and redistributing it to the Malay or Bumutra community. I'm constantly being muted. Can you hear me? Okay. So anyway, um, so if you look at our foreign ownership uh, shares in Malaysia, it's actually not gone down. So even from the offset, uh, the share of the foreign community back in 1970 was 63. The latest figure suggests that it's only gone down to 45%. So I'll quickly finish off here. So the conclusion is that the NEP has now a life on its own. Uh, nobody seems to be able to control it. Uh, senior Malay politicians in Malaysia, even the most senior Malay politicians that you can think of, are afraid to question the implementation of the NEP. Nobody is willing to discuss the NEP directly. The only thing they're willing to discuss is how to modify the NEP to make it more effective. Part of the reason is that all the major, major Malay political parties, here I'm referring to Amno, Besatu and PAS, they all rely on NEP and NEP related businessmen for fundraising and patronage. And it's becoming a central feature of the Malay state or the Malay agenda. Despite the failures we see with the NEP, there are some countries around the world that's actually adopted a version of the NEP. And I'd like, and I'd just like to allude to two countries. One is Fiji, the other is South Africa. I don't have time to go in detail, but you can look at it up yourself. <clears throat> so what are the key lessons? I think the key lessons is quite obvious. If you want to implement this sort of affirmative action, which is huge 
about almost half the population, you should target the groups that you want to help. And the groups must be very specific and very small. So using ratio criteria is never a good idea. And whatever you design, the affirmative action, it must exclude the elite. Second, you must set in an end date. And this end date cannot be moved. Even if the, system, even if the affirmative program is not working, you must not change the end date. And do not leave the end date to the politicians. I think the third lesson is that you should not have a moving target. One of the problems why the NEP has lasted for so long in Malaysia is because they keep changing the target. First, it was 30%. Then it was a significant share. Now they don't even define what is the share they're thinking about. They just call it the Malay agenda. And if you're going to have a review of any affirmative action, do not let the politicians take the lead in the review. And the biggest lesson is that almost anything can be defined as affirmative action. And once that it is politicized, it is no longer possible to have a rational debate on affirmative action. It's just become part and parcel of the political landscape. Thank you very much. Well, Thank you, James, so much. I, in a panic, just wrote down some of your last comments. And um, I think I'm gonna spend the rest of my career thinking about must exclude the elite. Um, I've been writing about the elites of the NEP generation in their various forms for 30 years. Um, and that's an incredibly wise statement that you made. Um, thank you again. So I'm going to ask you to place any questions that you have in the chat. Um, as I introduce our first commentator, Dr. Munira Alatas. Munira holds a doctorate from Columbia University. She is currently a lecturer at UKM in the program in strategic studies, and she specializes in geopolitics, strategic thought, foreign policy, and alternative approaches to international relations. She's written extensively on the topic of decolonizing knowledge and the role of West centrism in the production of knowledge. And she writes and speaks on the politics of identity and educational reform in Malaysia and in Southeast Asia as a whole. Munira, if you can unmute yourself and please provide your comment. Thank you, uh, Patricia. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Good morning and good evening to everyone. Um, thank you, James, for, for your presentation. Um, my, my comments um, will occasionally complement what you have said, but at the same time, uh, I, I'm trying to present another angle of looking at this whole discourse on um, the NEP. Uh, James has, uh, you correctly, pointed out that the NEP was originally intended to address poverty and to eradicate the identification of race with um, economic function. Um, but the, there are two questions I would, would add on to this entire discourse. Um, the first being, what does failure of the NEP um, really mean? And the second is, what was the essence of the NEP abuse that took place over the decades? And by, by these two questions, uh, I re refer specifically to um, leadership, okay? Um, now, the, the NEP, as, as James uh, correctly mentioned, is not purely a Malay elite idea. Um, that's correct. Um, but the ideas leading up to the NEP were not solely from the Malay elite establishment. Um, what is left out in this, this uh, acknowledgement is the impact of foreign ideas from our colonial past, not just the academic community, but the colonial administrative 
um, officials. The discussions and debates about the NEP are incomplete without reference to this historical continuity, uh, meaning the British policy of keeping the Malays underdeveloped through a combination of psychological domination um, and divisive colonial capitalist policies. Um, if we focus on this angle of, of thinking about NEP, it enables us to critique today's leadership, which is very important uh, because I think there's a lot of misconception or avoidance <clears throat> of critiquing or criticizing uh, current leadership. Um, this is to make greater sense of how and why the NEP has lost its focus. We can comprehend how leadership keeps us deliberately ignorant um, of history because it does not serve its political agenda. Uh, we, we know very well in history uh, subjects in schools, for instance, it's carefully selected, the subjects that are taught, um, the topics that are left out deliberately, uh, and a whole slew of other um, manipulations of, uh, within the education sector. Our government uh, realizes that a public that is informed by historical continuity is more likely to question and hold them accountable. So uh, we need to keep this in our mind when we um, uh, analyze the development of the NEP over the decades. Um, <clears throat> Uh, this would generate deeper analytical discourses in the public sphere, which leadership does not want. Um, keep the public ignorant, uh, it's better for governance or bad governance. Such narratives are more threatening as opposed to a public which is stuck in an endless verbal loop, which is what we are today um, <clears throat> in discussing NEP or the Malay agenda or uh, ethnic supremacy, this is an endless verbal loop and it's always latched onto um, <clears throat> the NAP. Leaders are more confident of controlling these endless conversations because they are the majority, um, Malays are the majority, and they have the NAP to fall back on. Um, so the, the question, the first question I posed earlier, what does a failure of the NEP mean? What does it really actually mean? Um, to my mind, it's a, a deliberate neglect of the original tenets of the NEP um, by the elite Malay leadership themselves. And it's not the failure of the NEP um, policy per se. The original proposal had been neglected. It was for a level playing field, merit-based um, assistance, and as James mentioned correctly, the 30% equity ownership, which is now um, very fluid, um, unknown what that equity ownership is now. Uh, and importantly, also independent of ethnicity or religion. Um, now those responsible for drawing up the NEP uh, in the 70s, uh, were aware of the delicate balancing involved. However, over time, history was forgotten uh, deliberately uh, and overlooked. Ignoring history perpetuates this uh, false consciousness uh, reinforced by Malay leadership today, which then reconstructs attitudes and meanings around nation building, which um, James referred to uh, as well. Um, mainly the Malay agenda and um, labeling Malays as the rightful owners of the land. Um, now, I also would like to say something about the abusers. I mentioned that earlier. Um, this creating a false consciousness of, of or, or a strategy of manipulation using NEP. This false consciousness or, or manipulation is 
uh, characterized by, by the following, um, referring to the Malay masses consistently as incapable or Malays need to catch up, Malays need to develop the entrepreneurial spirit, um, Malays are backward, Malays lack a scientific mind, it's in the Chinese DNA to be business-minded. Uh, these are officials, uh, you know, um, official statements or in the, in the way of publications that have come out of AMNO, for instance. Um, the constant othering leading to ethnic tensions and societal polarization that we, we are seeing increasingly. Um, all this was orchestrated to mislead the masses into thinking Malay leaders are actually encouraging them by saying, you know, you're backward now, but you need to improve. So there is this whole um, idea of offering viable solutions to help them succeed. Um, and to me, this is actually the start of the failure of NEP because uh, specifically with the publication of two books, uh, we have Revolusi Mental first, and uh, or rather Malay Dilemma came out in 70, 1970. And then the following year, we had the publication of uh, Revolusi Mental. And this, it, these two books kick-started that whole discourse or the narrative of the backward Malay. You need to improve. You're not scientifically minded enough. Uh, and our min uh, prime minister, Previous Prime Minister Mahathir is uh, very well known for, for these uh, statements. Um, and it has been intricately woven into, uh, as, a, as a sort of moral foundation to prop the subsequent policies after NEP, um, specifically the NDP, the NVP, the Vision 2020 as well. Um, so there's this moral foundation in inverted commas, okay? Um, these narratives, when I say refer or go back to a historical understanding, these narratives perpetuate the colonial capitalist ideology of the British, which was then to psychologically and subtly humiliate the Malays. Jose Rizal wrote about this extensively too, about the Spanish uh, in, in the Philippines and um, Franz Fanon wrote about the same uh, strategy in uh, French Algeria. Uh, so um, this was a way to keep the natives, the majority population in check, to keep them dependent on leadership, allowing for bargaining power between leadership and the masses when the need arose. So um, what differs between uh, the British uh, period and contemporary Malay leadership today was the element of racism. Um, racism among the majority population. The former believed, the British believed, the natives were indeed inferior. Uh, the latter, meaning the, the contemporary Malay leadership today, uh, they don't think the Malays are um, inferior because the leadership themselves are Malays. They, they would not think of themselves as inferior. But instead, there is a segment uh, within the Malay society who wants to dominate econom economically. And their way to keep check and to dominate economically over the masses of Malays is to keep the NEP alive, uh, couched in this... Um, this aura of, of encouraging them to get up to the 30% equity, but the sincerity and the, the actual um, practice is not there. Um, so what is then the, the ultimate failure of the NEP? Uh, James listed it very, very succinctly, and uh, I agree with, with all of them. Um, but to me, the, the, the main problem with the NEP is that Corruption is a big development, uh, but leadership has digressed from the original focus on building capacity and empowerment. And this is, this is where we have failed to address it in the discourses or in, in the popular imagination. 
Nobody talks about building Malay capacity or empowering the Malays. Um, they have strayed from addressing poverty regardless of ethnicity, that too. Um, there has been too much focus on we need to own something um, to reach a certain percentage of equity. This, it's a superficial uh, encouraging uh, mantra that we keep hearing. We need to own it. We need to gain, gain equity, but there is no talk about building the capacity despite the fact that there are quota systems to enter higher education, um, graduates who are in the market still do not attain that level. Um, that, that's a whole new discussion anyway. Uh, the more important task of building capacity is um, also confidence, building confidence, self-esteem among the Malays continues to be neglected. Um, the strategy has been to subdue the masses while keeping the elite few, as, as James correctly said, um, keeping the elite few successful. The others, the non-Bumis, the non-Bumiputras, um, continue to remain the perpetual victims. So this is the sad failure of the NEP and I, I don't see it improving unless there is political will to start discussing the ultimate strategy of leadership uh, employed since the 1980s and the reason why they refuse to detract from um, this policy. Um, I, I think there might be questions later uh, for James that, that uh, would revolve around, um, uh, well, I'm hoping, <laughs> about the issue of how NEP is uh, connected with um, the mushroom, uh, the, yeah, the rampant corruption now that we are facing. I, I think we need to speak about that in connection with NEP. Uh, and to me that discourse, it's, it's not yet um, a regular uh, narrative. That, that's all for now, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Munira, for that incredibly insightful uh, reflection. And um, it, it complemented James's perspective so absolutely beautifully.